is our first stop on our uh, tour of secret places in Sausalito. And uh, we are, believe it or not, in Sausalito at an undeveloped parcel of land. And it's quite a sizable piece of land, too. I'll show you where it is in just a little bit. But what's unique about this area is that, except for a little bit of uh, French broom and some pompous grass and some thistle, this is the landscape that the Miwok lived in for 4,000 years at this site. And this tree right here is a willow. And uh, it's called a, uh, a salsa, uh, or a grove of these would be called a sausal. A sausal lito would be a grove of little willows. And here they are still growing today. The, the shape of the leaf is rather interesting. It's light on the bottom and green on the top, but it has a very distinctive shape. And coincidentally, the, uh, the Miwok uh, had a, what was called a willow point. And this is the, uh, the shape of the, of the Indian point that has always been called a willow point. This is from an atlatl. This was a throwing spear that they used for killing deer to provide food to balance out the shellfish uh, that they enjoyed. There are four settlements within the community of Sausalito where the Miwok actually lived. And it was always next to a spring, just like this. This is one of the original springs that still runs out of the hill, surrounded by the willow trees that uh, attracted the name to this area. Originally it was called Sausito, and then became Sausalito named that by William Richardson, the Grove of Little Willows. Okay, I know that you're probably curious about where exactly it is that we are right now. So why don't you follow me and I'll show you. Here I come, up through a big field of anise and up to the landscape and a surprise as to where exactly we were. Well, here we are, Bridgeway and Kinko's. driven by or walked by this site a hundred times. This is the old uh, mine shaft that has been locked up since 1910 with an iron door that was put on it. And we're here today to go inside and take a look inside with uh, your accompaniment, hopefully. Um, now we've got two fellows from, uh, uh, from Public Works, Dan Zapponi and Kent, who are going to break the lock because we don't have a key anymore. And uh, We'll be able to go in after that. This hasn't been opened in a number of years. Uh, was originally put on to keep kids out of there. We know that Earl Dunphy, who was a former city council member, uh, used to play in here back around the turn of the century when he was a little kid growing up in Old Town. Okay, the lock is broken. The door is open, great. Here we go in. Now this only goes in a little ways. We don't know whether it's a collapsed mine shaft or if it's, uh, uh, this was as far as they dug. And we're still not certain about what they were digging for. But uh, it was rumors that it was manganese I'm going to have to put on my hood because of the water. But look, here's a clue. It may have been an aluminum mine. This is where they had these uh, preformed uh, cans of uh, aluminum, which they then uh, would dig out and send to the, uh, to the soda works companies. A little bit of uh, historical litter. Now here we see a pipe shaft draining water into the site. And if we look back here, we're going in about 30 feet. We see the back, the back of the area. You can see the amount of water coming out. This was a common problem when you were mining in these hills. This was probably a manganese mine. That's the original belief. And you can see up here, there's the original shaft. So it looks like this mine shaft collapsed a number of years ago. And uh, this is all fresh water coming from the springs 
up in the hills. And you can see it running out here. So now you can tell everybody that you once went into the mine shaft up on Sausalito Boulevard. Here we are at Christ Episcopal Church, one of Sausalito's historic landmarks, and we're going to go inside today. Now this is the way you used to go in back in the 1880s, right through the belfry. You'd enter in through a narrow door here, make a sharp left, and go into the church. Today we're going to go in through the addition that was added in 1913 to make access to the church a little bit easier. So let's go inside. In 1913, when they changed the design of the church from an access through the belfry to the front door, they had to make certain accommodations. And one of the accommodations was to be able to get into the belfry again. Here you can see one of those changes. This pew happens to have hinges on the bottom. That's to allow access to the little door here. And this is where the acolyte would go before church in order to ring the bell. So let's go in to the belfry. As you can see, this is not meant for everyday uh, access, probably just for the occasional repair that had to be done to the belfry. <sighs> okay, <laughs> here we are in the uh, pigeon-free upper reaches of the belfry and here's the bell the beautiful Netherlands cast bronze bell and let's see if we can find the name and here it is right here grace be thy name so that's the name of the bell her name is grace and let's hear how she sounds ceases to amaze me some of the things that still survive in Sausalito. Here we are in one of the oldest houses in the Glen, in Turney Valley, and in the basement of this house is an original speakeasy, and I'm going to let you have a little peek at the place, okay? Now this is the old door with the windows up high where you would have to identify yourself when you gave a knock at the door. Somebody would look out from behind a curtain, see if you were okay. If you're okay, then you're allowed to come in. So follow me. Now we walk back in here into the actual speakeasy. That's this little room. It's a very secure room. And I, when I say secure, I mean bars on the windows to keep out any pro-high officers who might happen upon this place or get a lead that this was a, an underground uh, bar. And over here you can see frosted glass, nobody can look in. And up here to check to see who's out there, you got a little peep window with bars on it. Now here we've got the original stand-up bar. Bar rail down here, mirror behind the bar. There were probably three or four tables here with chairs. And uh, this was a place where friends and neighbors could gather to have a little something to drink. And these are a few bottles from our collection at the Historical Society, which kind of explain the situation. You can see here, this is the Rainier Brewing Company, and it lists uh, this product as a lager brew, but it has no alcohol content. All of the breweries had to change to making soft drinks, just like the bars in Sausalito became soft drink parlors. You could still get a little booze illegally, but you could not buy it from a commercial enterprise. Here's Cascade Brewery, and it's making a non-alcoholic drink and bottling it. Now here's a, an interesting bottle. This is Amazon Bourbon, and this is from Jay Lauder. Now Jay Lauder was the one who built the Walhalla, 
which eventually became the Valhalla. And during Prohibition, his daughter, Annie Lauder, was arrested with a huge amount of what was called jackass brandy, uh, which was meant to intoxicate. So those are, uh, those are a few bottles that kind of capture the whole period of the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act, which made liquor illegal, distilled spirits illegal to sell uh, between 1919 and 1934. However, you could brew it at home, and any good speakeasy, like a place like this, would have a hidden area where you could keep your liquor. Now, you probably didn't notice when you came in, but here, here's the hidden panel right here. And when you open this door, there used to be another door right here that you had to unlock again. Here's the old light switch, which takes us into this area. And this is where they brewed their beers and their wines. And uh, these were all racked cabinets for uh, turning your bottles to uh, keep the sediment clear. And uh, this cabinet here is where they uh, kept their old wines that they had brewed right here in the basement. Now, to prove that this was actually a brewing area, we go over here to the wall, and you can see there are numbers all over the wall. And it says right here, Saturday, 11 24 23. The Volstead Act had been, in, in, uh, had been created four years earlier, and so people are brewing their own beer. These are the number of days that it sat, and then here, about 10 days later, it says bottle. So you've seen not only the uh, inside of a speakeasy, but also a little private brewery right here in Sausalito. We've just seen some visuals, uh, images that show what exactly was involved in the dynamiting of a hillside and the moving of all of its land onto a marsh in order to create a shipyard. But just putting dirt into wet mud is not going to stabilize a landscape. So the question is, how did Bechtel manage to stabilize this huge facility and build gigantic ships on mud? Well, this is the way they did it. They drove pilings almost every square foot over the entire Gate 3 and Gate 5 area. And they did that by uh, acquiring eucalyptus pilings wherever they could and then running them down into the ground with giant pile drivers in order to stabilize the ground. They put in 26,000 pilings into this area. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Now let me show you what they were able to do thanks to all these pilings. Okay, so here we are inside one of the structures. This is underneath the actual shipways where from 1942 to 1945, they built 93 Liberty ships. And they had to support that massive amount of weight. And this is what the pilings did. The pilings are all underground here under a layer of cement. And some of them come up through and they support these huge 10 inch by 20 inch beams that span the entire ways. This beam and these pilings had to carry the weight of a single Liberty ship, and that Liberty ship weighed 16,000 tons when it was completed, and there were six of them being built continuously side by side on six ship ways. Two of those ways, or the buildings related to them, still exist down here at the waterfront, and that's where we are. are at the ferry boat Vallejo. It's uh, in its new life. Uh, this ferry boat uh, was originally a commuter ferry boat and then it was the headquarters, the focus of the Sausalito art community when Varda and Alan Watts lived here and now it's reborn. We're lucky enough to uh, have the opportunity to go inside thanks to the current owners. So uh, let's go in first of all into Alan Watts side of the ferry boat. 
So here we are on the Alan Watts side of the ferryboat Vallejo. And this was Alan Watts's great room. This is where he held meetings and seminars and people would come to hear him speak and hear about his Eastern philosophy and to ask questions. It was a very austere side of the ferry boat. And it also is where the paddle wheels of the old ferry boat Vallejo originally resided. You can see the huge timbers out here that used to support the top of the ferry boat and allow the paddle wheels to turn in a circle here. Those, those paddle wheels were removed in the 50s and these windows were installed. Now you had the serenity and the quiet over here and then on the other side of the wall it was total chaos because that's where Varda lived. This is my favorite side because it's full of color, collage, paintings, uh, works by Varda, and uh, even the original table where Varda would entertain hordes of people who would come here to see him. Uh, there, there, would always, there was always food and drink and music. That was Varda's side of the ferry boat. And uh, outside on the deck here uh, was where he would launch his boat, the Sithera. It was a, an old sailing boat with a big uh, sun, sunburst on the, uh, on the mass. And uh, th he would take out people like Anais Nin, Sterling Hayden, Allen Ginsberg, Evan Cannell, Maya Angelou. Imagine that group of people all out for a sail on one boat. And we also have one of his pieces here. Uh, this is a, uh, one of his collages. He was a collage artist and he worked in fabric and in paper. And this one is called Circus. And you can see the many shapes and colors that he incorporated into his pieces. Everything was uh, cut and arranged in a special way. And he was very pr prolific. He turned out hundreds of these. And uh, now you would picture Alan Watts on the other side. How would he put up with this sort of thing? Well, he loved uh, Varda and he loved these pieces of sculpture around him. He loved the fireplace with the lights, the bottles, the music and all of the, uh, the imagery. He found it very stimulating. So now we have the very rare opportunity of actually going down into the hull of this ancient ferry boat to solve the riddle of why this one survived and all the other ferry boats died. Welcome to the inner workings of the ferry boat Vallejo. Here inside the hull, we can see the answer to the question of how this ferry boat, built in 1879, survived when hundreds of others built after it have long gone into the mud of the bay. And here's the answer right here. The Vallejo has an iron hull, and cast iron was impervious to salt water as long as it was maintained. And this old hull has kept this huge boat afloat for all these years. So this massive hunk of rusted steel is actually the inner workings of the powertrain for this old ferry boat. It's always been described as a single cylinder steam engine, but you can clearly see there are two cylinders here that ran this just like a railroad train. The boiler for the, uh, that created the steam that powered these two cylinders and then in turn turned the paddle wheels was located on the other side of the bulkhead behind us. Well, I'm going to make a vertical ascent here, Dave. Uh, probably when the uh, surveyor originally came up here, these eucalyptus were not here. The hill sure was. Yeah, so let's hoof it. <laughs> uh. Well, here's what looks like the corner post of the property. So, somewhere right around here, according to the map should be a blaze and uh, should be three marks in the rock. Here it is, right here. Hey Dave, over here. What do you got? 
I think I think this is our uh, this looks like our mark right here. Look at that. Yeah. Three in a row. Cut right in there, finger deep, designed to last forever. Well we know the way they left us a trail, so let's head out. This way? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's see what all this meant. Yeah. So we are turned around, but looks like somebody did some work on this man. So here was your first. A beautiful winter's day to be doing this. Here it is, right here. There it is. There it is. Yeah. Number four. It's a beautiful Roman numeral. Yeah. Somebody must have laid up here for an hour, maybe more. Carved that. Look, it's even got serifs on it. Well, the surveyors were also good draftsmen. Yeah. Right down in the V. I love it. Look at that. It's just cracked off and submerged. Well, maybe somebody else will. Uh, come up here and take a look for it. I don't know if I'm going to come back up here again. We're going to leave a clue for somebody out there in the audience or somebody who's watching this video to come look for this uh, this mark someday. Long after we're dead. <laughs> well, uh, what they'll look for is a line of posts coming up the hill, converging with a line of posts that are going down the hill. And right where they converge is this chert outcropping. And this big post with the blazes on it will be lying right over the number four. I think we ought to put them blaze up so yeah. somebody could see the hatchet marks. Right. Let's just hope this stays in place for a while. And this post is pointing right towards Angel Island. So uh, there's another clue for you. See if you can find it. Oh, let's just say that you're one of the adventurous few who comes up here to look for the blaze in the boulder. Well, do yourself a favor and walk about three, four hundred yards along the trail, right along the ridge, and you'll come to another rock. And this is a famous one in Old Town. Because when you lived in Old Town in the 20s or 30s, the big thing to do was to pack a picnic basket and walk straight up the hill from 2nd Street, and you would come to this rock outcrop. And this rock outcrop has always been known as Appetite Rock. And when you got here, you were hungry. Entering here, what is actually a very flat and sizable area in a rather uh, steep terrain. This area is, measures about 30 feet by 60 feet, and we are quite certain that this was the original site of the sailor's graveyard. Um, and unfortunately, it's all covered over by French and Scotch broom, but uh, Todd, the videographer, and I were able to uh, spend an hour or so and clear a path through here and clear away uh, the broom from a couple of interesting uh, elements to this site. Uh, one of them is the old uh, post here that was from the guardhouse, and this was uh, the post that had the, um, that had the gate on it, and this would pivot open uh, when somebody was permitted to enter Fort Baker, uh, and that was there until the guardhouse went away. But here we've got this uh, very curious uh, brick surround and uh, we are quite certain that this was originally uh, one of the uh, graves right here, right on the bluff on the edge of, uh, of Richardson's Bay. And uh, we're hampered somewhat by the fact that all of the headboards were wooden uh, because um, 
uh, they were uh, accidents that happened at sea or there was a sickness that went through a ship and so all they had was a piece of wood to put up a cross, a small fence, or a headboard. There were two of them, however, that had marble headstones and those are the primary elements that made up the, uh, the clue to the graveyard. Now where are those marble headstones? Well, let's go see where they and the sailors are buried. It's just going to require a road trip. Yeah. Yeah. Scary. We're entering now the uh, the graveyard at um, or the cemetery rather. That's the proper word, cemetery right? At Mare, at Mare Island. Try and find which one first. Uh, the first one we're going to look for is Maurice McGrath. He was a uh, member of the English uh, Navy, and according to the stone. Uh, he fell from the uh, the rigging in uh, on the ship, the Amphitrite, in Sausalito Bay. This is U.S. Navy, U.S. Navy, and here it is, right here. Yeah. Okay, what is it? In memory of Maurice McGrath, died August 29th, 1855, age 18 years old. A young man. By falling from aloft on board. HMS Amphitrite. Now we know that this gravestone was in Sausalito, in our sailor's graveyard in the 1850s. Hmm. It was there until 1916 when apparently the uh, GSA, uh, federal government, moved it from there at Fort Baker over here to uh, your cemetery in Mare Island to be with the other Navy uh, people. Looks like it was broken at one time. And then probably may have been broken in Sausalito and then restored when it was brought over here along with the remains. Mm -hmm. uh, the one we're really looking for is a fellow named Henry Mortimer and he was a uh, American sailor and his story uh, I think is an interesting one. According to our book it's about four rows up here. Okay, well let's see if we, we can, can find it. Over there. Okay. This, is, this has got to be it. Uh, an unusual stone. It's amazing. Uh, what's interesting about it, besides the fact that we can see Henry Mortimer's name here, uh, is that there's uh, this plaque that's added to it. And this is particularly interesting because it tells us that it was moved here, the stone was moved here. And it, it puts the same information that's on here, which is being lost by decay, it's been uh, put up here on the plaque, and it even tells us here that uh, it was uh, moved to the Navy, uh, the Navy Yard at Mare Island in 1916. Hmm. And uh, it says here that uh, uh, he was born in 1820 in London, England, drowned August 27, 1850 in... Sausalito Bay. Yeah. The, the 1850 is the important part of this uh, because you can see he was on a, a U.S. naval ship. It was USS Vincennes and the Vincennes was part of the Western Exploratory Group that was uh, out here and they arrived coincidentally at the time of the gold rush and at that time there were 300 ships abandoned in San Francisco Bay and so when a Navy ship came into San Francisco Bay at that time, they had to keep the crew under guard so that they wouldn't defect because they wanted, this was an opportunity Jump for them. For the gold. Well, we got the log book from the Vincennes from the 1850 and it told us about Henry Mortimer and it said, uh, Seaman Henry Mortimer went over the side today. He jumped into the water and was swimming for shore, said they put a longboat in, and by the time they got to him, he had drowned. 
So it appears by reading between the lines on the gravestone and the logbook that he was trying to leave the ship in order to get to uh, the gold fields. That's our guess. And here it is. This is an amazing thing to, uh, for me to see because I've heard so much about it and read about this stone uh, in the history of Marin County that was written in 1880. And here we are today. Really appreciate your help, Ken. the end of the ferry boat that the captain was in when yes. the boat struck the uh, San Rafael. Right, this is the Sausalito end. Right. And so it was going, he was out ringing the bell and uh, did not see the little San Rafael which was a faster ferry but couldn't get out of the way of the Sausalito on that night. And so this end, the fantail, went right into the side of the uh, of the San Rafael, going right into the dining hall of the uh, Right ship. in the middle, and it stuck there, which um, was probably a good thing because they were able to transfer uh, passengers across to the Sausalito because she sank in 20 minutes, uh -huh. so they had to move very quickly. Old Dick the cart horse was downstairs, uh -huh. and they tried to get him to move, but he... He wouldn't come. He went down with the ship. Uh -huh. But have you heard the rumor? Have you heard the rumor that uh, Old Dick survived? That sounds like a great story. It's a good story. We don't. We have no actual proof, but we have uh, the story is told that he swam and uh, came out over at Fort Baker at Horseshoe Cove, and they found him there the next morning. I hope that's true. That's uh, a, <laughs> I would feel good about that. We go. We go on uh, rumor and word of mouth quite often that's at the right. Sausalito Historical Society. <laughs> <laughs> that happens to us too. Uh huh. Well, it must have been a dramatic uh, scene that night, November 30th, uh, isn't that what it was? November 30th, 30th uh, 1901. 1901, on a foggy evening about 6 o'clock, mm -hmm. right off of Alcatraz, and uh, there was Captain McKenzie was the captain of the San Rafael, mm -hmm. and Captain uh, Tribble? Tri Tribble, Tribble right. was the Sausalito captain, mm -hmm. and uh, they were both uh, at the realm trying to find their way in this yep. dense fog and the bells and whistles did not uh, help that night. They couldn't they couldn't sense what direction they were coming from supposedly because of the fog because you right. couldn't hear clearly what direction uh, sound was coming from. And I know uh, Fat, uh, Captain Tribble uh, sounded the bells that he was going starboard mm -hmm. and um, for some reason Captain McKenzie thought he was going the opposite way and it just, it didn't work. Uh -huh. uh, so there was pandemonium, and as soon mm -hmm. as the accident happened, um, there was panic on the ship. People mm -hmm. jumped in, right. thinking that they'll be sucked under, and um, others, you know, ran to the plank. Mm -hmm. um, miraculously lost, um, there were, what, what? I, speculation right. again, is three lives were lost, mm -hmm. uh, three uh, crew members, right. uh, one passenger, and then old Dick the cart, cart horse, which mm -hmm. is really kind of amazing in 20 minutes. Right. And 
there had to be hundreds of people on at that time. Yeah, and no official record. No official record. Right. right. Well, you know, these are the tie to Sausalito is so amazing, not only because this is the ferry boat Sausalito, which ran out of our harbor, but the fact that uh, we also have the Jack London Association. Yes, yes. Uh, the story being that Jack London, uh, right around that time, was staying at Anna Duffy's rooming house in Old Town and was working on The Sea Wolf, uh, the famous book that he did. And that book opens with the famous collision of the two ferry boats off of Alcatraz Island. He changed the names, but he used the same reference to this very collision. So it has all these overtones uh, for Sausalito, and the fact that uh, the crewmen uh, lived in Sausalito, and uh, one or two of the deaths uh, were of uh, residents of the town. So yes, and it was a small town a at very the small time. Town. Yeah. Uh, the, um, I have the book downstairs, and he refers to the Sausalito Ferry as the Martinez then. That's right. Now, they made a silent movie of this, of his sea wolf, and the Sausalito was in that silent movie. Oh, really? And I haven't found it, <laughs> but uh, I've heard a lot about it. If you find uh, it, you tell I me. I will. Okay? I'll share it with you. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much, mm -hmm. Kathy. What a great uh, visit you've made this for us. Well, here we are in a little place, uh, part of Sausalito, that many of you may not even know about, but is extremely important to the history of this town and the forces that shaped the little village of Sausalito. And that is World War II and the building of the Marin ship. This shipyard uh, incorporated 20,000 workers and it had six ways. And over the period of three years, from 1942 to 1945, they built 93 Liberty ships. And all of the things that we see here uh, in this area from the uh, engine room and then over here to the captain's bridge, uh, all of these items came from one particular Liberty ship and that's the Mission Santa Inez. And that ship is the last surviving Liberty ship of all of the 93 that were built. The rest of them were lost either to enemy action or to uh, sinking uh, or to just over the years uh, slowly falling into decay. Uh, so we have an opportunity to possibly go out to the ghost fleet where this ship is kept. It's out in Sassoon Bay and uh, if all goes well, we will get approval for a uh, letter that I wrote requesting that we have permission to go on a boat out to the the Liberty ship Santa Inez and I can take you there for a tour. So I'm anxious to hear the results of that uh, letter. Uh, yes sir, Mr. Frank, it's Wes Irvin with U.S. Maritime Administration. All right. According to regards to your uh, request to Captain Johnston uh, to go out and visit the uh, ship and the fleet site, mm -hmm. unfortunately this isn't going to uh, work right now with uh, our staff time and other things that are going on, but uh, we certainly appreciate your request to Captain Johnston and oh, wanted to man. call you back as, as soon as possible here to let you know that, again, it, it will not suit at this time to do this, but mm. at a later date when we're doing other types of requests uh, like this and taking folks out to see uh, ships, we certainly will keep your request on file and do them as a group during that time. But any questions, I can be reached at 202-366-9963. I hope you all are having a happy new year and that all is well, sir. Thanks so much for your time. Bye-bye. And uh, messages. Thanks a lot, Wes. Uh, let's see. See, it's got to be more than, uh, more than one way to skin that cat. Hey, Wood. It's Phil, Frank calling. Hey, listen, uh, do you still have that biplane? is a 1930s Belgian biplane that's owned by Wood Lockhart in Sausalito. And we are going to hop in and we're going to fly up to Sassoon Bay where we're going to come in low and take a close look at the Mission Santa Inez, the last surviving Marin ship uh, craft 
one of the Liberty Ship T2 tankers. So come along for the flight. here at the Jeremiah O'Brien, which is a fabulous 440 foot long Liberty ship in original condition. This is what the ship looked like when it was new, when it was commissioned. It was built in 1940s uh, for the Second World War effort and uh, had a very interesting history. It was attacked by enemy ships, by uh, airplanes. It had been strafed. It returned fire, protecting itself and then lived through the war, survived, and was restored in the 1960s and 70s. And then uh, when they had the 50th anniversary of the uh, landing at D-Day, uh, this ship traveled all the way from here to Normandy. And they did it with a crew of volunteers. And the average age limit, or age, was 70 years old of the crew that went over. The ship is 440 feet long, and when it's full, it weighs 14,000 tons. So they're going to do something very special for us today, and uh, something they don't often do. So let's go and have a look. We're in the very heart of the Jeremiah O'Brien. We're down in the engine room with Bill Duncan, the engineer, standing right next to the telegraph. And uh, Bill is going to do something very interesting for us. He's going to fire up this steam engine of the Jeremiah O'Brien for you, the viewer, to see what it's like. So, Bill, this is the telegraph? That's correct. When we get the signal from the bridge, they have a telegraph just like this up on the bridge. They'll signal down what speed they want to go and what direction they want to go. The, this side, the red side of the telegraph is the stern. The green side is ahead. See, they're both identical. Right. Go slow ahead or slow astern. Half ahead, half astern, and so forth. Right. Depending on what uh, speed and direction they tell us by moving their levers up there, we match that by this handle here, and then we go to the operation of the engine. Okay. And this is the throttle? That's the throttle. Okay. This is the reversing engine. Okay. So if they want to go ahead, I have to set this reversing engine for ahead, and then I have to open up the throttle to put the speed, the steam into the machine and set it to the speed that they want. Great. So I'll do that now. You're going to open the throttle. Okay. Okay. Now I'll open up the throttle a little bit to give it the speed that they want. So many revolutions per minute. And what, how many horsepower is it generating? 2,500 horsepower. 2,500 horsepower, amazing. And these are the oilers? That's the oilers. Right. We have to lubricate by hand uh, on this, uh, this engine. There's no automatic lubrication. Everything is by hand. They feed the oil into the oil uh, cylinders. We have cotton wicks which suck the oil up from the cylinder and drops it down through a tube which runs onto the bearings and drops the tire. That's, that's that has to be constantly replenished. Great. Well, Bill, 
Thanks a million for showing up. Really appreciate it. Well, let me just tell you here, this, uh, this here, what you see going on here is called racking. We be racking our juice and uh, racking our brains on how to do this process. This is our first time. Now, you see here, we got a tube running down here. We're trying to drain off the liquid and leave the dregs. So we're transferring this here with this gasoline siphon hose over here into this jug. One big question, did we clean the gasoline siphoning hose before we used it to clean off our dregs? Uh, I sucked it out real good. You sucked it out real I good. I sucked it out real good so it's nice and clean. And uh, now we got here, we got ourselves five jugs of this plum wine. This is undistilled liquid, sugar added, probably drinkable in about a year. Jethro, he's uh, busy on the cleaning process. I don't like to participate in all that illegal stuff. I'm in the uh, health department here on the operation. And we're making sure everything's very clean here. So the racking process, it's not only important that we get the sediment out, but we get any of that bacteria, any of those things that kind of make your tummy go, oop, oop, you know? So, Well, we finally started our still after a little bit of experimentation. And I got it cooking up this morning. I could smell something, and here it is. Here's our first batch coming out, and you can smell it all over the neighborhood. It's a Sunday morning, so hopefully people won't hear too much or smell too much about it. Uh, but look at this. Oh, a little bit of heaven. Got an old burner here, and uh, so we got the first batch going from... Uh, Bottle number one, our premium brand, and we also have these bottles standing by, and we're in business. Okay, here we are deep in the woods of Sausalito at the site of the still. Not only do we have the still, but we have some of the brew here in the jug. It's been aging for a couple of years. And once again, before we close out this segment, I have to remind you of the importance of keeping the identity of the distiller who I have been working with, as well as the embedded reporter myself. Uh, very private. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. I appreciate it. Uh, you're right, Mike. Real good. Um, okay, so I think what we're going to do is just sample a little bit of this product here. Get a little test of this. It's been aging now for three years. Yes, and so it uh, has acquired a nice uh, color. Uh huh. There's a little. Yep. And a little for you there. That little golden amber oh, of Sausalito. Lovely. Uh huh. Okay, to our efforts. Homer. Yeah, Jeff. Uh -huh. And you. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 